Hi, this is Dr. Eric Lang. In this next 45 minutes, I'd like to walk you through some basic techniques of how to customize your small group inductive Bible study to suit an audience which may comprise of some non-Christians in the mix. Whether it just happens that some of the members turn out to be non-believers or whether it is a small group study specifically designed for seekers. The basic ideas will be the same. Now, the techniques I'm going to talk about assume that you have already been thoroughly trained on the framework of how to do small group inductive Bible studies. If you have not gone through that, I would uh, suggest that you first uh, take the classes or the trainings to f completely familiarize yourself with the concepts of inductive Bible study, the observations, interpretations, applications, and group dynamics and questioning techniques and so on. This next 40 minutes is just to build on top of what you already know. So um, first, the agenda. We shall be covering uh, two parts. First, the objectives of evangelistic Bible studies, and secondly, the techniques of evangelistic Bible studies, which include the choice of passages, what are the appropriate levels of observation and interpretation, which may be slightly different, as you might expect, than uh, if you happen to be leading a study primary for believers. And then thirdly, the most important thing, the ultimate application, because it is by definition an evangelistic Bible study, we want to lead the people in the study to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate application. How do we go about actually implementing that? Uh, we will touch on that briefly. And then fourthly, perhaps of greatest interest would be how do we modify or fine tune the questioning techniques that we usually employ in leading a small group study. In a small group setting where there are believers, it is challenging enough. But if there happens to be non-believers whose backgrounds that we do not know for sure, uh, there may be a need for particular vigilance as to how to um, listen to the flow, accommodate uh, whatever personality that happens to be uh, in, in the mix, and then no matter by what methods, we shall bring the people in the group a little bit closer to Jesus Christ, to a knowledge of God, if not outright making a full commitment to believe in Jesus. Okay, let's get started. The objectives of EBS. Of course, we want to bring every person to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That means a person would establish an, a relationship with Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. Now, many of you may be familiar with this distinction between Savior and Lord because both are important aspects to our um, relationship with Jesus Christ. Once we have become a genuine Christian, uh, our relation, we relate to Jesus as both our Savior, someone who saves us from our sins, someone who redeems us, who pays the wages of our sins. That is Jesus' role as a Savior with respect to us. We have been dead in our trespasses and sins, and there's nothing we could have done by ourselves uh, that would restore our relationship to God. It takes God's uh, direct intervention, God's initiative to come to us, to uh, bring us back to life, to bring us to uh, basically revitalize our spirit so that we can indeed respond to the gospel message. Uh, we're not going to dive into the details of different schools of, of theology here, whether we, we have to have a saving knowledge first, uh, or do we actually uh, have a transformation first, or uh, the issue of um, is it, is it, does, 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 does the sinner himself uh, has any role to play in this initial phase of being saved? Let's not talk about that. But the key thing is that once we become genuinely saved, we do relate to Jesus in two respects. First, he is our savior. He paid the price of sin for us. He turned us into a new person. But there's, of course, a longer and more sustained phase of our relationship with Jesus after we become Christians. And that is, we are supposed to treat Jesus as our Lord, someone who dictates all the decisions, all our value choices in life. As the Bible says, we are not just a follower. We are not just a student. We are not just a believer in Jesus, although all those characterizations do hold true. But first and foremost, we treat Jesus as our Lord and we are slaves to him. Now, in today's 
politically correct environment, many people uh, try to shy away from that term. But that's exactly what the Bible uses, the term slave. In other words, a slave does not decide for himself what to do, what's next, what is important. No, all those decisions are set by Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. And Jesus, as Lord of our lives, after we become Christians, all our decisions are supposed to be predicated on catering to the pleasure of our Lord Jesus. We want to bring every person into that situation, into relationship, uh, as a slave to Jesus as our Lord. Of course, that is a prolonged process. Many people use the term sanctification to describe the lifelong process of our becoming more and more accommodating to God's will in our lives. And, and so, so lordship is a continuum. Uh, however, the goal is not a continuum. Either we do try to treat Jesus as our Lord or we don't. And until and unless a person fully believes, fully desires to have Jesus as his Savior and Lord, um, we cannot say that that person has truly entered into a saving relationship with his God. So all goals of evangelistic Bible studies uh, all studies, we do not aim for just a person to say, yes, I want to receive this free gift of a grace of salvation. But we also want that person to say, yes, I also want to commit my life to serve Jesus wholeheartedly from this time forward. And that is the objective of evangelistic Bible studies. Now, let me clarify further. We often hear Christians say, oh, I led so and so to Christ uh, last night. It all sounds like a person accepting Jesus is a binary event. Either he or she has accepted or he has not yet accepted. But at the same time, we are saying just now that to uh, relate to our Lord Jesus as Lord is an incremental process. So is a person being saved a binary event or is it an incremental process? Perhaps the best analogy we can think of is that of marriage. For a person to become married to another person, nowadays, at least in all countries, we go to a government agency, we register. Some people treat that as the moment when they become truly husband and wife. Some other people would think of the wedding as the moment when they truly become husband and wife. Most of these uh, pictures would try to depict marriage as a binary event. Either you're married or not married. And legally, it is indeed so. There's no such thing as you are gradually become married. But we all understand that marriage is actually a relationship. All relationships takes time to build. In fact, these uh, husband and wife probably knew each other for a long time. Some people for a few months, some people for many years. Some people knew each other ever since they were childhood. They were childhood sweethearts. So the relationship building is obviously an incremental one. But at some point, as the relationship, the loving relationship between these two people mature, and when it arrives at a certain level of maturity, when they're willing to cross the threshold and stay to the entire world, tell all their friends and family that now that they have entered into a new relationship from this moment on, their two lives shall be joined as one, as the Bible has depicted. And from that moment on, they are living not as two individual people. Their minds, their value system, their decisions are always shared. And that is a binary transformation, but the relationship is an incremental event. Same thing with our relationship with God. It's like mar getting married to Jesus. We, it takes some incremental steps to gradually lead a person. So our goal for EBS then would have to speak to both scenarios. Yes, we want to uh, gradually lead a non-Christian to a point where he or she will say that, yes, I'm ready to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That is the big moment. That is the big commitment. But we fully understand that the relationship building gradually builds up to that moment. And in fact, even after the moment, the journey, of course, continues. The growth continues. And we would say it's not too far-fetched for us to think of EBS as uh, at least taking a person up to the incrementally up to the moment when he or she says yes. Beyond that, of course, we would treat that person as a Christian. Then we would say that it's no longer evangelistic Bible study. It is just discipleship uh, making. 
but the relationship building continues. Uh, some other people give the analogy of painting a portrait. Right? Uh, if you are a painter, you probably will start with an outline. And for all evangelistic, evangelistic Bible studies, we are trying to lead a person to have a clear and deep life transforming uh, understanding of who Jesus is. It's like painting a portrait of Jesus in front of that person. You may start with an outline, a high level outline, just rough shape of what Jesus is like. And then you gradually add in more and more details. You fill in the shades, the colors, uh, the twinkle in, in Jesus' eyes, the words that may have come out of his mouth. So we paint a portrait of Jesus stroke by stroke. Each time you gather the small group together for another study, it is as if you have added yet another stroke to this picture, to this portrait. Okay, some people want to ask this question. We all know 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We always quote this Bible verse to remind Christians that, hey, we should study the Bible because the Bible is the inspired Word of God and is profitable. Profitable for what? Well, profitable for training in righteousness so that every person, every Christian that is, would become equipped for every good work. Which then raises the question, would this goal, this objective of the Bible aiming to equip every person for doing good work, implying doing good Christian service, would that objective be applicable to a non-Christian? I think the answer is a resounding yes. Let's break this down into two parts. First, the scripture is inspired by God. That is a simple statement. There's no qualifier there. So of course, the scripture is the inspired word of God, whether it's for Christian or for non-Christian, whether for, it's for someone who believes in God or even for the atheists out in the streets. Whether they admit it or not, that doesn't change the fact, it does not change the truth that the scriptures are there. It is inspired by God. And because it is inspired by God, it is authoritative. By that we mean that whatever the Bible has to say on any life situations, when the Bible says certain things are wrong, it is wrong. When the Bible says certain things are good, assuming the sentence does not have any qualifier to it, then it is good because God decides what is good. And whenever the Bible says certain things happen in history, whether people believe it or not, we as Christians know that the scripture is authoritative and hence we do believe that it did happen. When the Bible says that God created heaven and earth in six days, we believe that happened. When the Bible said that the flood happened, we believe that it did happen. When the Bible said that Jesus died on the cross and then rose again from the dead, it is a historical event. We accepted it wholeheartedly. Now, so that part does not change. It is inspired by God and it is authoritative. Now, even though the Bible is not a science textbook, as we always, always say, if the Bible happens to have something to say about some objective scientific fact, we also take it as true. So, we have to be clear uh, about the fact that the entire Bible is authoritative, not just some part of it, not just some aspect of it. It's not, not authoritative only when it comes to the moral issues or ethical issues. It is also authoritative when it comes to the historical issues, uh, of factual events, and so on and so forth. And given that it is authoritative, yes, uh, as, as long as we know how to approach uh, the, the studying of the Bible, we will find that to be profitable because, number one, it tells us things that otherwise we would not have known. And secondly, it tells us how to behave uh, and it will have tremendous consequences because not, on, not only would the consequence be temporal, it will not only affect our uh, temporal life on earth, our choices, our decisions would have eternal consequences. So we better make the right choices. And how do we know a choice is right? Well, God decides what is right. God is the standard of rightness. 
of righteousness. So it, we better find out if we do not know uh, what God considers to be right and good, uh, we will be in deep trouble. So it is important, it's pertinent on us uh, for us to understand what our Creator desires and hence we live accordingly to the best of our ability. And perhaps even more importantly, and it is of great comfort for us Christians to know that not only does God demand that we live in a certain way, God also enables us to live in a certain way. Uh, God is the empowering God. He, God does not make impossible demands on us. Uh, God does not even make demand on us and leave us to our own devices in fulfilling His requirements. God actually provides the means, the instruments, the capabilities, the encouragement, and the guidance to us so that we can live according to God's instructions and satisfy God's demand. That's true. Only if we have Jesus or the Holy Spirit living inside us, the Holy Spirit enable us to live a godly life. So this sentence of equipping every man for good work certainly applies to Christians and non-Christians alike. The, the only reason we may have some confusion is because so often when we read this verse, we forgot to read the context, the one verse before it. Verse 15, which says, and that from childhood, Paul was speaking to Timothy, of course, in the, con in the context of this passage. Um, Timothy, ever since childhood, you have known the sacred white writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, from this one descriptive statement, we can surmise that even for Timothy, there has been a period in Timothy's life when he had already been exposed to the scripture, but yet he has not accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior yet. Maybe Timothy never heard of Jesus until Paul took the gospel to Asia Minor. So it is very possible that Timothy has all the, all the uh, pinnings of having grown up in a uh, pious Jewish family. Uh, his mother is Jewish, even though his father was Greek. But he has been exposed to the teaching of the scriptures. And the teaching of the scripture was authoritative. The sacred writings was able to give Timothy the wisdom, which prepare him, which quote-unquote leads him to salvation. Now, it does not substitute for Timothy's acceptance of the of the gospel. It does not substitute for the fact that it has, uh, it, it has to happen with the coordination of Paul bringing or explaining the gospel to Timothy. But the scripture, the, Holy, the sacred writings have prepared Timothy for salvation. So we fully believe that whenever a non-Christian opens the Bible, reads from it, studies it, especially with your guidance, it would prepare him for salvation. For a non-Christian, the power of God is not out of reach to transform him. So long as that person, maybe without his consciously having already made a commitment, so long as he's attracted to the person of Jesus Christ, God's power can already start working in his life. How? One of the most important channels is by that person hearing the word of God. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you that even if a, a non-Christian comes into in your Bible study, not yet with the correct attitude, but he's interested enough to come and sit and listen to your study and hear about other people discussing the Bible. Just from hearing the Word of God, we believe the Bible itself is the living Word. It's the living Word of God. In other words, it has its own volition. The Bible just by the sound of it, by a person hearing the word of God being spoken, being read out loud, is sufficient for the Bible to do work in a person's heart. But the fact that he is sitting there, allowing himself to hear the word of God being read out loud, I think that in itself may be enough to sow the seed of the gospel or even to gradually change the heart of a person. So never, never, never give up any chance whatsoever of reading out the Bible in the hearing of a non-Christian. Okay? All right, let's go on to our second part, the techniques of EBS. 
So again, assuming you are already thoroughly familiar uh, with all the that all the techniques, all the skills pertinent to leading a good inductive Bible study, here are some of the slight refinements to suit a non-Christian audience. First, the choice of passages. Uh, of course, even for Christians, there are many parts of the Bible that we tend to shy away from. Right? Most of us would never devote a series of Bible studies just to look at the genealogy, for example. Um, many of us rarely would open up uh, Leviticus or Numbers or Exodus and dive into the design of the tabernacle or the, all the ornaments in the temple of God. Things which seem, it seems to be a little bit remote for us. And it, frankly, they are a little bit hard to follow. Now, however, if you happen to be studying some other topics, for example, if you happen to be studying about the accuracy of the Bible or the, how the, all the prophecies about the, the lineage of the Messiah, uh, he has to be both a the descendant of David and yet not a descendant of one of David's only sons. How is that possible? Well, that's when the genealogy of Matthew and Luke will come into play and resolve that mystery for us. But very few of us would just say uh, and sit down and say that hey let's let's spend the next month studying the all the genealogies just for, just for the genealogy's sake. Granted, that may be the case. No part of the Bible is irrelevant to a Christian's life. Every single word we believe at some point of our Christian growth will come into play. Now let's take that as as a a, a, a statement of faith. But what about for non-Christians? Well, um. There are certain genres of, uh, of the Bible as literature that are more suitable for the non-Christian, just for the simple reason that it, certain genres of literature are easier for an uninitiated reader. There are narratives, there are uh, didactic passages, teachings, there are prophecies, uh, there, there's poetry, and there are such things called uh, apocalyptic literature, which usually deal with the last days. Of all these different genres, naturally, we will say that narratives are the most suitable for the non-Christian, for the evangelistic Bible studies. Why? Because narratives deal, deal with real human life stories. As we know, later on, in all inductive Bible studies, our goal is to get to the applications. A prerequisite for successfully applying the scripture is that the reader or the student first is able to identify himself with a certain character, either explicit character or an implied character in the passage. And the characters in the narrative are most clearly defined. So it is uh, most likely that the student can readily identify with whatever is happening in a narrative passage. Do non-narrative passage have characters imply? Yes, as always, there are at least two characters always implied in any form of literature, the author and the intended reader. So when Paul writes to Timothy, of course, Paul is a character in the passage. Timothy is another character in the passage, or maybe uh, the Christians in Ephesus, the Christians in Colossae, the Christians in Thessalonica, they are also intended uh, recipients, they also may be characters. But it would be a little bit uh, less direct for the people in the audience to identify with those characters. So narratives are most direct. Secondly, uh, I think in general, we, you may want to avoid extremely heavy doctrinal passages. Now, we should not shy away from the difficult passages for discipleship. We have to talk about those difficult topics such as eternal security, such as pre-election, such as the Trinity of God. All those are extremely important doctrinal topics. But let us shy away from uh, tackling directly those, those topics by picking a passage to deal with them because that's frankly not the most urgent thing for a non-believer. The most urgent for, thing for a non-believer is to come to a sufficient knowledge about Jesus as a person, as 100% man and 100% God, and to become attracted to the beauty of Jesus so that he desires to establish a relationship with Jesus as his Lord and, and his Savior. And it's not important for us to fully resolve 
issues such as whether it's possible for a non Christian for a Christian to lose his his salvation. Well, maybe even the, the theological professors have difficulty resolving some of those issues after debating for two thousand years. So after all, uh, we know that. Uh, a full resolution of those questions are not essential to a person's salvation. But we do want to use the incremental uh, growth of even a non-Christian for to lead him to gradually to come to a an understanding, a basic framework of what the Bible has to say about human sin, about human frailty, i.e. we are limited with human weaknesses. There are a lot of things that we cannot do. And that's usually what draws a person towards God. We want to talk about the topics of love, faith, and hope, which is relevant you know, for all our people, whether in good times or in bad times. We want to lead a person to see that God has power over creation and hence over every part of creation, including ourselves. So given all these constraints, then I would recommend that the, the best kind of Bible passages to be used for evangelistic Bible studies are what I call the Jesus encounters. The kind of narratives where a certain incident happened. And in that incident, one person or a small group of people would come face to face with Jesus. To whether have a, a, a direct dialogue with Jesus or experience a certain miracle performed by Jesus or have had their lives directly transformed uh, by their knowledge of Jesus. There are just tons and tons of beautiful stories in the Bible which are Bible uh, which are Jesus encounters. And many of these Jesus encounters are what I would qualify as so-called life crisis situations. When Peter was walking on water and started to sink, that is a crisis. When the disciples uh, who were experienced fishermen. One night when they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, they ran into a storm and they were scared for their lives and Jesus was sound asleep. The disciples had a life crisis situation. When Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, woman by the well, the Samaritan woman had a life crisis situation that she's not even willing to admit or maybe she's not even aware of. She was a social outcast. That was certainly a life crisis. Jesus brought her head on into confronting that uh, social outcast situation and helped her resolve that life crisis situation. When 5,000 people listening to a prolonged sermon of Jesus, they ran out of food. They were hungry. That is a group life situation. And when a rich young man one day, uh, through just meditating on his own, uh, came to find that despite his pious young life, uh, he has lived everything according to the law to the best of his ability, he was still dissatisfied. He still feels that he has not satisfied all the requirements of God. And so he came over to Jesus to ask, Sir, tell me what I can do to inherit eternal life. That is the reflection of a life crisis situation. All these are beautiful life crisis situations which would make for perfect stories for evangelistic Bible study. So I strongly encourage you. And needless to say, the majority of these life crisis situations are to be found in the four, in the four Gospels. A, a fair amount of them are also found in the Acts of the Apostles, such as when Paul himself exper experienced the tr greatest life crisis of, him uh, of himself when he was on the road to Damascus. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the details of refining our observation and interpretation questions. Uh, as you know, the key to a successful inductive Bible study is that we design our question set properly. And properly usually implies that it has to suit the audience. Uh, hopefully, you know something about their background, then you know to avoid certain things that may be inappropriate. Uh, more likely, you have to understand the intellectual level and uh, their uh, educational level. So all those are incumbent upon the experience and skill of a Bible study group leader. Sometimes you have to play by ears and adjust on the spot. Especially, let's say, if you're leading a Bible study in the conference, you don't you don't really know uh, the people 
before. So you walk in there and in the first few minutes, you have to make a, a quick judgment as to exactly what is the right level. Now, but typically you do, uh, you do know something about the background. If you go to West Coast Conference, chances are your group members are at least college educated, young adults, or at least college students. So you don't have to dumb down your questions to the level of a little child. By the way, it is also possible to lead a successful inductive Bible study for a little child. So all kinds of levels are possible. You just have to pick the right one. Now, when it comes to non-Christians, it is usually the mistake of the leader because we are we have been living in church and leading Sunday school and leading uh, Bible study among Christians for so long, we forgot that most of the world does not talk about religious things the same way we do in church because most of them are not Christians. They don't know the Christian jargons. They do not agree to or they have no clue or what uh, some of the theological, the doctrines that we take for granted. They don't use terminology that we consider to be standard, like calling each other brothers and sisters. So uh, let, let us just extract ourselves and back out into, uh, let's say, uh, what the kind of language that you have used in, in an office cafeteria. You will not call, be calling your friend, brothers, and sisters, will you? <laughs> now, so for non-Christians, uh, there are a couple of things we certainly want to avoid. First of all, we want to avoid highly uh, theological jargons. What are some examples of very theological jargons? Terms like justification, uh, apologetics, uh, eschatology, etymology, uh, all these big sounding words. You can use them to impress some of the other Christian in your group, but let's avoid using them. Sometimes we just assume that people uh, immediately understand what we're talking about when we say justification. That is actually a really used word in the English vocabulary, right, in ordinary life. So we have to explain it. So what what is right in God's eyes, what is fair, uh, what, what is legally binding, uh, what, what, what is, um, uh, represents a, a sense of, of rightness, you may have to just substitute the word justification with some of those other terms. So that's certainly applicable to the topic of interpretation, uh, rewording your interpretation questions. When it comes to observation, also, we just have to assume that people have no biblical background, and that's a fair assumption. So, um, we usually takes uh, some time for you to rewind and provide sufficient immediate context for any discussion. First of all, you have to provide sufficient explanation of some of the sp special biblical slash historical. Uh, terms or names or jargons. For example, who are the Pharisees? Who are the Sadducees? What, what, what do rabbis do? Uh, what is so, spe so specific about the temple or the Jewish synagogues? Even the word scripture is not very often used. Non-Christians have heard of the Bible, but they may have rarely used the term scripture to describe it. And what is the difference between Old Testament and New Testament? Old Testament is referred often simply to as the Holy Scriptures or sacred writings um, in the Bible itself. And all the geo geographical names uh, like Bethlehem um, and Galilee, all these things, all the uh, cultural terms like what is a Sabbath, uh, what is Passover, and um, what uh, some of the religious things, what is circumcision even. So all these things, you just have to be prepared that you need to give a one or two sentence explanation. One, one good way of doing it to avoid having to talk about all of them yourself as the leader is to have another more mature Christians, whether you tell that person ahead of time, you can ask him or her that question so that he and she can explain it. Or if you think that is pretty well known among the Christians, mem Christian members of the group, you can say that, hey, so-and-so, can you please first explain a couple of sentences? Who are the Pharisees? Why are they relevant? Why were they always in conflict with Jesus' preaching? You can ask so-and-so to explain so that it does not become a unilateral lecture by you, but you maintain the dynamics of the group. In case they also cannot answer it, 
then yes, you do have to step in as the leader to give the right background. Okay, so all in all, I'm just saying that we always have to uh, fine tune our question set so that it suits the audience. Now, having said that though, I want to impress upon you the point that the inductive approach as well as the deductive approach, which is basically a lecture type of interaction, the inductive approach is still very powerful. It doesn't matter whether the audience is Christian or non-Christian. The power of inductive study is always there. And that is uh, because the induct inductive learning depends on the person himself coming to realize, coming to understand the truth instead of you telling him what you already have digested. And that's especially important for a non-Christian coming to a saving knowledge of Christ, that you do not force feed your conclusions to him, but you just let him see the Bible for himself. And because we believe the Bible is authoritative, when the Bible speaks to him directly, the Bible can defend itself. You don't have to worry about it. You do not have to be the Bible's defender. When the Bible talks to that person directly, that person would discover the truth by himself. His head would come to a moment when he suddenly to understand the truth, like a light bulb turning on. And that's when the inductive approach hits him uh, with tremendous power. Okay, so let me summarize. The power of the inductive approach applies to Christians and non-Christians alike. However, when we lead a EBS, we should avoid the doctrinal terms and Christian jargons. Uh, when it's necessary to provide a cultural or historical background for the passage we study, especially because we prefer to pick narrative passages, you as the leader either have to provide the, the background or you arrange for one of your more mature members in the group to provide that background. And we definitely should steer clear of unnecessary theological controversies. Um, by the way, some of the most popular theological controversies that argumentative non-Christians like to bring to you are things like, how do you explain evil in this world? The problem of pain in the world. Uh, can God move, uh, uh, create a stone that is so heavy that he himself cannot move it? Those hypothetical situations. Uh, you should anticipate some of those questions specifically intend to trip you up and not fall into the trap, okay? So know that they, they may come, sometimes inadvertently, sometimes intentionally brought by the non-believer, non but you should steer clear of that. You can always use the simple group dynamics to get around that by saying things like, oh, that is a very good question. Let us talk about that later, but let's first finish the study of this passage. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this rich young man. Okay, so don't fall into the trap of being drawn off on a tangent because the, the non-Christian want to debate you on some hypothetical philosophical issue. Okay, the ultimate application of all EBS is of course, bring a person to the saving knowledge of Christ. That's what we call the big invitation. Know for a fact that in most cases, a non-Christian may not be ready to make that big commitment to receive the big invitation to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior right there and then. Although you should never shy away from offering him that opportunity. Uh, no matter how unlikely the situation may be, no matter how new a non-believer's exposure is the, to the Bible, never underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit. Never underestimate the possibility that a non-Christian may be ready. He's just dying for the opportunity to say yes to your big invitation to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. So always give that invitation at the end of a counseling session or a small group discussion or one-on-one -on -one sharing. Always give the big invitation. However, never be discouraged when the non-Christians don't seem to be ready. Does that mean that we'll have just to end the study right then without any options for a follow-on? No. Just remember, we are trying to help build a relationship, help this person build a relationship with Jesus. You are painting a portrait. You would not stop painting the portrait after just two strokes, would you? So when the non-Christian said, no, I still have many questions, or I have this objection, or that objection, I have this worry. Well, no matter what, when he declines the big invitation, don't give up. Give him some smaller invitation so that he can take the next step 
to get a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer each time. So what are some examples of a small invitation? Maybe you can invite him to come back to for the next study. Of course, you can invite him to come to visit you at church and you will go and pick him up. Uh, you will drive him to church this coming Sunday. Or if he's interested in this topic, come back to this Seekers uh, Bible study group. Come every Friday. Or you have a little pamphlet you can give to him. You promise to, to read that pamphlet tonight when you, when you go home. Or maybe you, you acknowledge the fact that there are still many questions that he does not understand. No worries. God can answer his questions directly. So why don't you give him a small invitation to go back home and pray on his own tonight. And you can teach him how to pray to Jesus. Uh, how to ask God to open up his eyes or his heart. That is a very, very powerful small invitation. So I'm sure you can think of more small invitation just to keep the relationship building. Now, in the situation where the person says that, yes, I'm willing to commit my life to Jesus Christ right now, usually you do want to take one small step after that big commitment to, number one, clarify. Uh, now you just pray to accept Jesus Christ. Let me, let me ask you this question. Where do you think is Jesus now in your life? Hopefully his answer would be, yeah, Jesus is now living in my heart as the Bible promise. Right? So in other words, after, right after he has crossed the threshold and accepted Jesus as Lord, ask a couple of simple follow-up questions. If this is indeed what you have done, where is Jesus now? Will you have uh, followed the same step as this Apostle Paul, who would now start sharing the good news, to, or like this Samaritan woman, who would run back into the village and tell everybody she knows about the Lord uh, she has met. That would build a lifelong habit of serving Jesus and proclaiming Jesus and testifying for Jesus. Finally, some tips about questioning techniques and group dynamics. As you know, we talk about op observation, interpretation, application questions. Usually observation questions are easier because they're based on whatever any person can read from the text. Uh, I will shift slightly heavier emphasis to observational questions for an EBS and a little bit f fewer interpretational questions. You can provide the interpretation as the leader, but application, of course, is always important. Secondly, shift to a slightly heavier use of close-ended and rhetorical questions. As you know, close-ended questions would guide the person to either answer yes or no. So it is a lot harder to go off on a tangent when you ask close-ended questions. Use more of that for EBS. Rhetorical questions is a form of close-ended questions. If Jesus is so good to us, is there any reason why we would not want to have him as a friend? That is a rhetorical question. So rhetorical questions are very powerful. You set things up, then you hit him with a rhetorical question, and usually the person will say, yeah, yeah, if Jesus is indeed as the Bible describes, I want to have him as my friend. And, and that is almost equivalent to giving your big invitation to the non-believer. Now, one slightly more advanced technique uh, to balance between observation, interpretation, application is what I uh, often love to use the so-called compound questions, which is combining an observation with an interpretation question or combining observation with an application question. I just give you an example. If Jesus is so good to us unconditionally, is there any reason why you would not want to accept him as Lord and Savior? That is combining an observation which I state without waiting for him to draw the observation. I draw the observation for him and then ask the application. More likely, you want to combine an observation with an interpretation question. If the disciples themselves are expert uh, fishermen, does it surprise you that they are so afraid in the midst of a storm? What does that tell us about the limitation of human ability? That is combining an observation, the fact that they are experienced fishermen, with an interpretation. What does that tell us about the limitation of human ability? So I provide the observation, and then I ask for the interpretation. And by combining these two elements of questioning techniques in an appropriate proportion, you can turn the most difficult interpretations into a, a simple enough question for even a non-Christian to give the answer. Okay, so I already talked about how not to let 
them lead you go off on a tangent. In the last slide of this PowerPoint, I have embedded two discussion question sets on the passage Mark 4, verses 35 to 41, which is the disciples with Jesus in a storm. One is a regular Bible study question set. The other one is a EBS version. And I just included them here so that you can, at your own time, open them up and do a side-by-side -side comparison how I do a simplification of the regular question set. Fewer questions, simpler language, and more use of the combination observation interpretation or combination observation application questions in the EBS version to give you a flavor of how to change any existing question set that you might have, refine it fine-tune it so that it's suitable for use as an EBS passage.